Hey everyone. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about uh, the architecture for OCR, which I think as you'll see makes a really nice bridge um, between the computer vision applications at the beginning of the course and the natural language processing applications that we'll be doing um, in the latter part of the course. Okay. Um, and so you guys will remember that kind of a major application of a vision that we talked about was object detection. And we saw how this could be used to recognize the layouts of very diverse and very complex uh, sets of documents, as well as, you know, for natural images and all kinds of things. So my general takeaway, like from my own experience with object detection is that at least for the tasks that I'm interested in, which are fairly complex in terms of documents, uh, the problem is essentially solved. Um, I'm not gonna say it's 100% solved because it would be great to need fewer labels. Um, and I'm sure that they there will be advancements, um, but the state of the art currently is essentially good enough to produce very accurate information. Um, for the downstream research that I want to do. So I'm not going to think I can't write that paper um, because the object detection problem is just too hard, um, even though it's still a lot of work. And, you know, kind of more generally, the literature is amazing to read. It consists of many of the most cited papers in deep learning. It's just an amazing body of work. Um, when we get to OCR, I think like that vibe is pretty different. Um, so many or most computer scientists see OCR and just documents more generally as essentially a solved problem. Um, you know, there was OCR that kind of, sort of, in a very narrow set of contexts worked like back in the 90s. Um, and that leads people to see documents essentially as solved, or maybe they just kind of know that they're not really solved, but they're boring um, compared to a lot of other applications. It's like how interesting can documents be? That sounds really like, like a total bore um, compared to doing something cool with people's Instagram photos. Um, but OCR is anything but a solved problem. And OCR problems still uh, derail uh, many promising projects. Um, and this may be starting to change. Um, there's been a lot of interest in about OCR in industry recently um, with kind of deep learning um, that make it just possible for it to be decent enough that you would consider using it in kind of some industry context that you wouldn't have even thought about in the past. Um, and there's been an increased interest in the deep learning community as well, albeit much more towards um, <laughs> what they call OCR, like in the wild, uh, meaning OCR on natural images. Um, so this is a few examples um, from street signs. I mean, essentially think about it as kind of, um, it's like the post COVID world and you guys decide to uh, rent a van and take a road trip with all your friends and you're gonna put those photos on Instagram and it's gonna be able to recognize, you know, what kind of beer you're drinking in the picture, the sign behind you, and you know, pr produce a caption based on that um, is like essentially the idea um, uh, with, the, uh, with the OCR in the wild. But still, these techniques are kind of essentially the same ones that you would use on documents. So I think that this is promising. Um, I think the methods that I'm gonna, you know, the architectures that I'm gonna show you today, I think that we're gonna see that change potentially um, in certain ways, but it's sort of the most kind of um, promising approach that we have now. Okay, um, so the current dominant paradigm in OCR has three components. Um, you start with a CNN features extractor. Usually you would want that to be ResNet. And so this is, we've already, we're very familiar with this now. Um, on top of that CNN features extractor, you stack a recurrent neural network, um, which in practice in OCR, is uh, usually going to be a bi-directional LSTM. Um, and then you have something called a connectionist temporal classification loss. And you just put these architectures together um, and stack them like they are Legos, just as we've seen uh, with many of the other um, neural net architectures in the course. And that's really part of the power of it is that you can stack these very different types of networks together and train them end to end. And so this is a picture of that visually taken from a 2015 paper that essentially introduced this concept. 
And so it's starting with an image of a sign. You pass it through your ComNet. So maybe not in 2015, but today this would be passing it through ResNet and you get a convolutional features map. And then you divide that features map up into um, uh, spatial locations. Um, essentially, you know, the, the length of that is kind of the depth of your features and it's a little box and you're gonna, um, essentially these are gonna span your image. So you're gonna have one and then the next one is moved over in the image and so on and so forth. You pass that into a deep bi-directional LSTM um, and then you have a way to align that sequence with the ground truth to evaluate how well you are doing. Um, so this probably doesn't make a lot of sense to anyone yet, unless you already have enough background to know what RNNs and CTC um, is. Um, and so we're going to spend most of this lecture um, introducing the concepts of RNNs and CTC, and then um, we will kind of circle back to stacking them together for OCR. And then we're going to talk about OCR like in practice um, next lecture, next Monday. Um, and I should note that even if you have no interest in OCR, um, RNNs and CTC are much more broadly applicable and are important to understand um, regardless. Um, and we see them used in a lot of problems, which are actually really analogous to the OCR problem. Um, so image captioning, this is where you have an image and you feed it into a network and it gives you a caption. You know, so it will say boy riding a bike um, when you feed in a picture that has that in it. Um, that also involves stacking a CNN and an RNN to generate these arbitrary length sequences of text that describe what's in the image. Um, speech to text, uh, which you're probably all familiar with, um, is very similar to OCR and its architecture. Um, instead of feeding an image into a CNN, you have some sort of frequency-based features extractor on audio data, um, and then you input that into the RNN and also like oftentimes use a CTC loss. Um, and so these are, I just want to note that, you know, these are architectures that are much more broadly applicable. Okay, um, so we're going to start um, by introducing uh, what a recurrent neural network is. Um, are there any questions though before I get to that about what I've said so far, kind of the overview? Okay. So thus far in this course, um, we have considered um, what are called one-to-one -one network architectures, uh, which you see in this picture depicted on the far left. Um, and so we have some input vector, you know, it could be, you know, the, essentially uh, the input vector is the um, RGB values of your image. Um, you feed that into hidden layers and the output is a fixed size output vector. And remember the fact that it's fixed size is like integral to the ComNet kind of to the architectures that we saw like uh, with classifiers. You have to know how many classes you have at the end because you have to specify what the weights on kind of that fully connected um, softmax layer are going to be. Um, and so that kind of architecture is not going to work for problems like OCR because you have an image again that you feed in. So there's just one input, um, but uh, you have no idea how many characters are in that sequence. So it's not like a one-to-one -one, um, sort of mapping. The output is not a fixed size. And so we're going to need like a different paradigm. And that's what RNNs are for. Um, they allow us to operate over sequences as an input, as an output, or um, potentially as both an input and output. And so um, image captioning, which I mentioned before, where you feed in an image and it gives you a caption and OCR are examples of a one-to-many case. So the input is an image and the output is a variable length sequence of, of words or characters. Um, the um, kind of many-to-many -many examples um, in computer vision often come from processing video, right? Um, so we talked about processing images but a video essentially is a sequence of images, which are like the video frames um, and people do various tasks on those. Um, in NLP, um, sentiment analysis, which we're going to spend um, a fair amount of time talking about 
is an example of many to one. Uh, so in sentiment analysis, you have a sequence of words um, that is your input, um, and then you have one output, which is the sentiment. So is this hyperpartisan or not? Is this conservative or liberal, positive or negative, et cetera? Um, something like machine translation is an example of many to many. So you have a sentence in English, it has a certain length, you translate that into a sentence in French, which also has a length that may be a different length um, than your input sequence um, in, in English. Um, and so all of these are contexts where this sort of, um, we need to be able to operate over arbitrary uh, length sequences. Okay. Um, and so the basic idea behind an RNN is that you feed it an input vector at every time step. Um, and it's also going to maintain an internal state. And it can modify that state as a function of um, what it receives at each time step. Um, and so that's shown here. Um, you have a, a function where HT is um, the state of the system or your history. And that's just a function of all the past history, HT minus one, and your input at that step. XT, that step of the sequence, which you know we call a, like a time step. Um, and so F is known as the recurrence function, and it is parameterized by weights W. Um, and very importantly, uh, the same function is applied at every T. And that's what allows us to use an RNN on arbitrary length sequences. So regardless of sequence length, sequence length, we just we're using the same function at every step. And so we don't have to specify ex ante how many steps there are because it doesn't matter. We're gonna use that same weight function on each step. Um, and then we're finally going to produce an output yt um, based on the state ht at that period. And so kind of the simplest uh, form of an RNN, which we'll see that nobody actually uses in practice, um, but it's good for fixing ideas. Um, is just that you take um, your history and you multiply it by a set of weights, WHH, and then you add to that your current input XT multiplied by a set of weights, WXH, uh, um, and then you just pass that through a tan H because remember we need nonlinearity in neural networks in order to be able to uh, approximate these very complex functions. Um, and that gives you your updated history. And then your output at that time step is again, just another weight matrix um, times HT. And note that these weight matrices don't have T indices because they're used at every time step. So you essentially just use the weights to project your history and your inputs. You add them, you squish them using this tan H function, which will give an output from negative one to one. Um, and uh, then you use another matrix projection on that hidden state to produce whatever output um, that, that you want. Okay, so this is just a little uh, toy example that comes from uh, Andre Karpathy. He's like the director of AI research at Tesla, um, but in a past life um, taught a CNN class at, at Stanford. And he's just like kind of, a, I'd say one of the most prominent people in the deep learning community, just because he explained th explains things like really well. Um, so you can, if, if you're looking around for an explanation of something, you kind of can't go wrong if he has <laughs> said something about it and it can be really helpful. Um, so in this like toy example, we have a character level language model for a four letter language. It consists of the letters H, E, L, and O, and we want to predict a distribution at each step uh, for what letter should come next. Um, and so to start with, we have the one hot encoding um, of the word hello. And so by one hot encoding, I just mean there's a vector um, for each of the um, tokens in the language, which are, there's just four tokens in this language, H, E, L, and O. And then, um, you know, for the H, the first value is equal to one. For the E, it's the second value, um, sort of, and so on and so forth. Um, and so that's our starting point. That's our input layer. And um, we have the four inputs, um, H, E, L, and L. And what we want to do is to be able to predict what comes next. Um, and um, so we'll use the recurrence formula to compute hidden states at every time steps um, using, um, we have the weight matrix WXH, which we use to project the input. And we have the WHH, 
which we use to project the history. Um, you know, if we were using an RNN on its own, usually we would just initialize this WHH to be zero. Um, you know, so at the beginning, there's no history to influence things. That's going to be different in the um, OCR case, which you'll, you'll understand when we get there. Um, and so we kind of smush this, you know, the sum by the tan H function. Um, that gives us an output layer. Uh, we take the softmax to turn these into probabilities between zero and one. Um, and then we take the output and we take it back in, back around um, to um, the input to see what we're expecting there. Um, and um, we can use this to compute a loss at every time step, add up those losses and use that to train the network. Okay. Um, so here's another example, which is also from Carpathy, but a little bit more um, realistic. And so we have a model just like the one that we saw. It's a character, character level RNN, um, but we're going to apply it to actual real corpuses of text. Um, so what, we, what, what it's going to do is uh, take a corpus of text, sample a mini batch of 25 consecutive characters as the input, and the, the target is just offset by one character because this what all this model is trying to do is to predict what character comes next. Um, and we feed in characters as one hop vectors. Um, and that means that for each of these mini batches, we have 25 softmax classifiers um, that um, we are using to predict what comes next for each of the 25 inputs in this sequence. Um, and we just add them up in bat prop because we're using the same weights at every time step. Um, and so this model is just about sequences of characters. It doesn't know that there's such a thing as words or higher level language concepts at all. It just is given a corpus of information and uses that to train um, and um, to try to figure out kind of what comes next. And so one thing we can do is just initialize with some characters um, and the RNN will give us the distribution over the next character in the sequence. We sample from that distribution, feed this into the next step and continue this to generate just arbitrary text. So we'd start with an A, feed that into the model, and it would say maybe N comes next, then we feed in the N, um, and so on and so forth. Um, and so they did this um, with the example of using all of Shakespeare's work um, as the training set. And you can see initially it's just giving pure random garbage, right? Because it's just initialized. The weights are initialized at random. And then you train some more and it's still not really giving you anything coherent, but maybe there's some simple words there like at and in and on. Um, and then you train some more and you can see that like, you know, a higher percentage of the things that are coming out of this are actually, you know, real words and you train some more and it kind of gets, um, better and better. And so this is an example of some of the kind of, um, you know, Shakespeare-like text that they generated from this model, just by seeding it with a random letter and then using the pre-trained model to generate uh, strings of text. Um, and you can see, um, you know, this is not exactly coherent, um, but it is generating things that are real words. Maybe there's some, um, some, sense of grammar, kind of albeit not perfectly, but it's kind of generating this text that kind of looks like Shakespeare. Um, and um, just from this very, very simple model um, that, that we kind of, that we just went through. Um, they did another example where they took a LaTeX file for an algebraic topology textbook. And this is what they were able to generate for that. So you see it learns things like you put the little squares at the end of proofs, um, you know, it learns kind of what comes after lemma. Um, this is a fun example at the top. It says proof omitted. Um, and so it's able to kind of, um, you know, it even tries to learn diagrams. So again, this is, you know, if you read this, it's not a you know, coherent mathematics, um, but it's able to generate something that kind of looks um, like algebraic topology. Of course, you know, I should say we can do way better with modern language models, um, which we're going to get to. Um, is soon in the course. And so this is an example of generated text from a model called GPT-2, um, which we'll talk about. So it has this prompt, um, a train carriage containing controlled nuclear materials was stolen in Cincinnati today. Its whereabouts are unknown. And you guys can see here the whole kind of text that generates the incident occurred on the downtown train line, which runs from Covington and Ashland stations. 
Um, you know, in an email to Ohio news outlet, the US Department of Energy said it is working with the Federal Railroad Administration to find the thief. Um, you know, even has a quote here, the theft of this nuclear material will have significant negative consequences on public and environmental health, our workforce and the economy. <laughs> um, and so you guys can see here that, you know, we can, we can, we can do a lot better um, than character level RNNs, but actually it's not clear for OCR that you'd want this, um, this kind of language model. And right now this kind of language model is not kind of embedded into OCR. So we'll come back to this later. Um, um, you know, this idea of whether you'd want kind of a more sophisticated language model um, in your OCR. But right now, kind of in the uh, state of the art, really what it's using is more just these kind of a standard RNNs that we don't use so much for language processing anymore, but um, there just hasn't been enough work to figure out how you'd embed this more kind of sophisticated model into OCR. Okay, so that's a general introduction to what recurrent neural networks are. Did that kind of, did that make sense to people? Are there any questions about what an RNN does? Okay. Um, and so the RNN formulation that we saw earlier is not used in practice. And so if you remember this formulation just took um, the weight matrix um, and it projected the history and it projected the input, added them together and smushed them through this tan H function to be between negative one and one. Um, and to understand why you would kind of never use this formulation in practice, um, we need to return to an earlier theme of the course, um, which is about how gradients flow through networks. Um, and um, so you'll remember kind of way back at the beginning of the course, um, we talked about back propagation, um, which is just essentially um, an application of the chain rule. Um, and so we're uh, back propping through our network to estimate the gradients that are then gonna be used to update our parameters. Um, and um, so um, we have, you know, in this uh, simplified example, inputs X and Y, and we're gonna pass them through some function F to get an output Z. And then remember we have our loss function, um, which is the difference kind of between our ground truth and our predictions. And um, suppose that we wanna calculate um, the partial derivative of our loss with response to X. Um, in order to do that, we have um, we have to for, we we just apply the chain rule, and it's going to be you know the partial of the loss with respect to z times the partial derivative of z with respect to x, you know kind of same thing with y, and it has this interpretation that as we back prop back through the network, um, we're going to be kind of multiplying at each step by the local gradient times the upstream gradient. And that's just like the chain rule. So as we back propagate through each of the nodes, we take the local gradient times the upstream gradient. And as we go along, kind of the upstream gradient is accumulating. And we talked about how this could create problems in very deep networks. Um, you know, especially if you're using a function like tan h and you're multiplying by a bunch of numbers between um, negative one and one or between zero and one, um, and you're doing that <laughs> over many layers of a network, um, you know, you're going to tend to have a problem of uh, vanishing gradients where your gradients disappear. And that means for the layers that are towards the beginning of your network, as you back prompt those gradients using the chain rule, they tend to disappear and you can't train um, the earlier layers of your network. And that's a real problem. And um, we talked about how we got around that in the ComNet cage, which we'll come back to in a minute. Um, and so it's, it's important to, um, understand, um, how gradients get distributed through these networks. Um, and so again, if you remember from earlier in the course, kind of a, a productive way to think about this is to think in terms of the computational graphs of our network. Um, and so I've shown a few examples here. Um, and so first of all, let's see what happens if you have addition um, in the network. So you have two inputs um, and you're adding them together to get the output node. So in this case, three and four, we had three and four together and there's seven. And then let's say we have a gradient um, two and we want to back prop it um, to um, uh, the, the, the two prior nodes. Well, 
you know, calculus sort of 101 tells us what's the derivative of f of x with respect to x uh, for x plus y. It's just one. Um, same thing, um, and then the partial of f with respect to y for x plus y is also just one, um, which means addition acts as a gradient distributor when we kind of take the local gradient where that plus sign is with respect to x and y, that local gradient is just one. Uh, the upstream gradient shown in this computational graph in red is two. And so we just multiply two by one. And that, and when we prop back, um, then that gives us two and two. Um, and so um, the add gate uh, distributes gradients. What about the multiplication gate? And so um, in order to get, um, the um, output neuron, we're taking the, the two inputs, two and three, and we multiply them together. That gives us six. Um, the partial of f with respect to x, if uh, f of x equals ax is just a. Um, and um, so when we, take the up, when we take the upstream gradient and we multiply it by the local gradient with respect to x for the top, um, that's just three um, and vice versa on the bottom. Um, and so that's going to give us, um, you know, the, the two local gradients at that point, and then we multiply them by the upstream gradient, which in the multiplication gate example is five, and that, that allows us to propagate back. And this is the case where we just talked about where we've run into trouble with vanishing gradients, because if we start multiplying um, by things kind of over and over again, and some of those things are, many of those things are less than one, um, you're going to have a vanishing gradient problem if they're greater than one, you know, systematically the gradients can explode. And we also have things like a copy gate, um, uh, which is effectively a gradient adder, or things like a max gate, uh, which is called a gradient router, which you can see if you're taking the max of something and you make a small change to the smaller thing, it's going to have no effect. Um, so it's going to be a gradient of zero. All the gradient is going to be on kind of the node that's the max. Um, and so it's really kind of important to understand this in order to understand why we have particular network architectures, because these network architectures are designed precisely to make it possible to train them. Um, and things like, you know, having a bunch of multiplication gates um, with small numbers is going to make it very difficult to train our network. Uh, so gradient flow complicates learning long run dependencies, which goes all the way back kind of at least to this paper in 1994. Um, and so uh, recall that what allows us to model arbitrary sequence lengths in an RNN is using the same weight matrix at every step. Um, and so when we back prop to earlier layers, um, the chain rule will entail matrix multiplication by that weight matrix over and over and over again because we're using that same weight matrix at every single layer to update. Um, and um, so you can show that if the largest singular value of W is greater than one, the gradient will explode. If it's less than one, the gradient will vanish, um, which means that kind of this very simple form um, where we're multiplying by W at every time step, we can't train that network because no, you know, if the gradient explodes, I mean, that's okay, we could clip it, right? So if the gradient's greater than five, then set it to five, but if the gradient vanishes, you know, we just have no way to update the network and that really is going to necessitate having a different architecture. Um, and so to solve this problem, um, we used uh, an LSTM model. Uh, which again is a pretty old model. So this goes all the way back to 1997. Um, and this is the model. I know it probably looks a little bit um, confusing at first, but we'll see that it's going to make a lot of sense. And just a notation, you know that that like dot with a circle around it is component wise multiplication uh, for matrices. Um, and so Remember that, you know, we have these two inputs, which are X um, and H. Um, so the history and the input vector. And um, in the LSTM, we're going to multiply them by a matrix whose dimension is 4H by 2H, uh, which is going to yield a, a 4H 
um, dimensional vector. They're get, we're going to take that and squish it um, by putting kind of the like H, 2H, 3H through a sigmoid and that final layer through a tan H function. Um, and remember the sigmoid is going to squash it to the zero to one range and the tan H is going to squash it from negative one to one. Um, and then um, we have um, uh, we have these um, functions that we keep track of. So a central part of the LSTM is something called the cell state. Um, and so, which is denoted by CT here. And um, the, sales, the cell state um, takes that F output that you see, which we call the forget gate and multiplies it um, matrix, you know, element wise um, by the previous cell state. And so you can see why we call this the forget gate. So it's helpful to think of these as being zero one you know, because we're using sigmoids, they're actually, they can be continuous values between zero and one. We do that because we need this to be differential, the um, differentiable, the backprop. Um, but think about these, these gates, um, I, F, and O as being um, zero, one. And so we have this cell state that we're keeping track of, which is like this internal state to the network. It's not going to directly influence our output, but we're going to keep track of it as we move through this recurrent network. Um, and so to update the cell state at each time step, um, we take this forget gate and multiply it by the previous CT minus one. And if we set the forget gate equal to zero or close to zero, and that's a learnable, right? That's, that's based on learnable parameters. Then we forget those previous elements of the cell state. Um, but then we also have, um, uh, this IG. And so you can think of that as I, the input gate. Again, think of that as being zero to one, um, zero or one. That says whether or not we want to write to that cell. And then G, which doesn't really have a nice name, um, is um, how much we write to that cell. And that G is going through a tan H, so between negative one and one. Um, and so that gives us the updated cell state. Um, but the cell state is something that's just kind of internal to the network. We also have a history, which is what we use to compute the output, remember, like at each time step. And so the history is equal to the O, um, which is the output gate. Again, think of that zero to one. We have this internal cell state. Do we want to write that to the history that the output can see, or do we just want to keep it internal to the model? Um, and then we pass the uh, cell state through a tan H again to, to introduce some kind of additional nonlinearity. And so essentially we're estimating these weights that give us uh, these, these different gates. Um, and those gates um, allow us to kind of maintain this internal cell state, determine how much dependence we want, um, which is where like the long-term, short-term memory um, and the name of the model comes from, right? It's telling us, you know, that forget gates tell us whether we want to remember or forget the dependency. And then we're learning, you know, how much we want to update the cell state with this combination of sort of O and I and G. You know, you could have just one there. People have done some stuff showing it's better to have I and G, but you could have just one number and it's probably not going to be that different. Um, and then we update this, the history and so we can kind of separately control what's the internal cell state and what's used to compute the output at every time step. Um, okay. So I think this is essentially just what I wanna say. So we're gonna allow part of the cell value to enter the history, uh, which determines the output and that's done in a learnable way. And so this might seem kind of like um, weird, like, um, why, why do we do this? Why is this better than just the um, vanilla RNN, which we showed that we're not gonna be able to estimate? Um, well, at the top here, you see the kind of the um, plain vanilla RNN where we're just taking uh, WHH plus WHHX, squishing it through the, and squishing it through the tan H function. Um, and you see that we're going to have to, when we backprop, we go over and over again through the the multiplication gates where we're multiplying WHH times the history 
over and over again. And that's gonna cause the gradients to vanish and explode or explode. Um, whereas now and we have this alternative additional path back through the network uh, when we're computing the gradients with backprop that essentially provides us this gradient superhighway um, where it's going through that add gate. So remember, that's just going to distribute the gradients. We're not going to, they're not going to deteriorate or explode as we go back. That add gate is just distributing the gradients back. Um, there's also the forget gate. Um, but as long as you don't forget everything, and remember this is like element-wise multiplication with the forget gate, not matrix multiplication. So as long as you don't forget everything, you're going to still have a gradient to prop back. Um, and we avoid forgetting everything by being sure that we initialize, initialize the forget gate near one. And so you're still going to have another kind of um, chain of the backward pass that's going through kind of the, the weight matrix, which is what we ultimately care about. But in addition to that, you have this um, un uninterrupted gradient flow that allows the gradient to flow back um, to earlier layers of the network or earlier time steps of the network. Um, with training, which is going to avoid the vanishing gradient problem. And so this may seem reminiscent of something else that we saw earlier in the class, which is ResNet, um, where we had these skip connections, which are again, kind of um, addition. So instead of, you know, um, instead of um, estimating a weight matrix, we multiply that times the input to get the output. We estimate the residual and we directly pass the input um, with those kind of with those skip connections um, there um, and add it on to the residual that we estimate. So that's again giving us these addition connections that uh, just distribute the gradient and it gives us kind of a gradient super highway to get gradient prop back to those earlier layers. Um, and there's also kind of a 2015 paper called Highway Networks that's kind of an in between to ResNet and LSTM. And it's, it's super interesting because um, ResNet has been just enormously influential. Like it's um, kind of central to allowing very deep networks. Um, it, like I think I mentioned, I think in 2020, it was the most cited paper in Google Scholar. Um, but kind of like a part of this idea kind of existed in LSTM, like all the way back in 1998. Um, and of course, ResNet isn't just this. You also needed like batch norm and kind of other things to make it work. Um, but it's just kind of interesting that essentially this is a pretty powerful idea. Um, this idea of having these gradient highways um, that allow you to have kind of very deep architectures, whether it's very deep in an RNA sense of having these like long sequences or deep in terms of the number of layers um, in a ComNet. Um, so a paper, you know, you might be wondering like, well, this is, it still seems kind of like weird. <laughs> like, why does it have this particular, you know, input, output, forget, the gate gate, like, um, so there's a paper called LSTM, the Search Space Odyssey, um, which I thought was a great title. Um, and it documents in a lot of detail that results are fairly robust to changing around the details of the LSTM architecture. So you can change around the details of these gates and um, maybe it does a little bit worse, maybe not, but it's kind of like we've settled on kind of the LSTM. It seems to be the architecture that kind of works the best across different contexts, but you can vary it and nothing is going to be kind of knife edge uh, to kind of exactly the, the details of the architecture. Um, it's also worth noting that today it is much less common to use LSTMs for natural language processing. And so if you were doing NLP, like back in 2016, um, you would probably be kind of using LSTMs to do everything. And some people kind of still do that. There may be some context where they are appropriate, but uh, most modern NLP uh, uses something called the transformer architecture, uh, which operates over um, inputs in a sequence in parallel through an intention mechanism, rather than processing the input sequentially. Um, and so we'll spend, you know, we'll spend an entire lecture um, talking about uh, transformers. Um, but I just wanted to note that now in case you're wondering, well, why are we doing this? Um, it has led to much better results in many NLP tests, but it hasn't been systematically incorporated into OCR in a way that improves performance. Um, and we kind of tried doing some OCR stuff with attention, but I think like 
you know, as much as we talk about like neural nets as being Legos and you just stack them, there's always um, details that you have to pay attention to when you stack them. And right now it hasn't really been kind of, um, Transformers hasn't really been incorporated into mainstream OCR, but I think you'll see that change in a year or two. Um, but something that we are gonna talk about more, I think next class when we talk about OCR in practice is that it's not even obvious that you want you know, this kind of like high end language model in your OCR. Um, you know, so just to kind of uh, briefly foreshadow that, you know, um, the part of OCR that's generally the most giant pain and where it's probably going to fail is when you OCR names, like either people's names or place names. And that's really kind of like central to what we as social scientists would like to OCR. We want to OCR information about individuals' biographies or patent, like, holders or board members. It's like very common to have individuals be the unit of analysis. If individuals aren't your unit of analysis, places are probably your unit of analysis. And again, like places are proper nouns. Um, and which is already like a hard problem because there's not a language context the way there would be if you were like ocr Shakespeare, <laughs> like kind of in the example that we saw. Um, you know, um, but then beyond that, if your model's been pre-trained on like books and it's expecting kind of natural language and instead what you have is lists of proper nouns that can make your performance worse, right? Because now it's expecting some coherent sentence structures and like, you know, somebody's last name is Birch and it thinks the next word should be tree, but it's not, you know? And so like, it's, <laughs> It's not really obvious that, that you want this anyway. Although in practice, the off-the-shelf OCR solutions that you use are gonna be trained on natural language. And that might be, you know, in addition to the fact that it's a hard problem, that can be part of the reason why, even with English, even with things that are pretty recent, when it comes to proper nouns, it can really give you garbage. Um, but that's a good segue back to OCR. Um, so I've shown you this whole kind of like R and in architecture, um, but how does that, how does that, how does that relate to, um, to uh, OCR? Um, so this is an example, um, again, taken from that 2015 paper that came up with kind of the dominant paradigm for OCR that's used uh, by like Tesseract and Easy OCR, which are kind of the two main open source solutions today. Um, and so, um, we start with this image. In this case, this is a natural image of a sign. We feed that, say we feed that into our CNN and that's gonna give us um, this um, features um, output. And we're gonna divide that kind of spatially over the image. And it has a certain depth, right? Which are the features. And each of those feature sequences correspond, they have a particular receptive field, right? They correspond with a particular part of the original image. Um, and um, then we, those are the steps in our LSTM. And we make predictions about what character is in each of those um, feature sequences, which have been um, extracted from our features map. Um, and so the contextual information uh, from the sequences that the RNA captures will tend to make the OCR more stable and accurate than if we treated each character independently. Um, so for example, wide characters take several frames to describe and by having this sequence information, by keeping track of the sequence through that cell state um, as you move through the network, the model is going to be capable of learning that. It's going to be capable of learning that this S kind of like takes, um, you know, three feature sequences um, to capture. Um, there's just like kind of um, obvious things if you think about it. So say you're trying to tell the difference between an I and an L. It's easier to do that if they're next to each other um, or if you kind of have both of those in your memory than if you're just trying to do it independently. Um, the RNN captures information about what tends to appear together. Um, and so, like I said, this could be good or bad, but assuming it's been trained on something that looks like what you want to OCR, that's a really good thing. I think the problem comes in, and especially for us, when it has been trained on something that doesn't look anything like what we want to OCR, then that might not necessarily be helping you. But in principle, that should help you out a lot. 
Um, in OCR, we're going to use a bi-directional LSTM, um, which allows us to consider context in both directions. And so to do that, we just combine two, uh, two LSTMs, one where we run the sequence forward and one where we run the sequence backwards. And in practice, um, uh, we'll also stack multiple bi-directional LSTMs, um, which just, you know, that gives us more parameters. It results in a deeper structure that allows higher levels of abstraction, kind of in the same way that ResNet 101 is going to do better than AlexNet with nine layers or 13, whatever AlexNet had. Um, eight, I can't remember precisely, like um, the stacking multiple LSTMs is going to, um, usually it should help you out. And so this is just a picture, a diagram again, taken kind of from the paper um, that, that suggested this um, paradigm. And you see the LSTM cell there with the gates, um, just another, um, and the, the sigmoid functions to squish it. This is just kind of another picture that's essentially um, uh, showing the computational graph um, for um, LSTM. And then you stack those and you see the arrows going both ways. So you go forward and backwards, and then you have multiple LSTMs stacked on top of each other. Okay. And so the RNN outputs a character prediction um, for each features sequence. And so you see the feature sequence is there in the bottom. We've taken those out of our CNN. Uh, each of those um, is a, a time step in the LSTM. And then that's going to output something. Um, so you see there it's outputting blank, S, blank, T, blank, A, A, T, T, E. And if you remember the original image was state. Okay, so this then raises the question, how do we compute the loss? And how do we kind of collapse that into like state? Um, which brings us to the next topic, which is connectionist temporal classification or CTC. Um, but before I talk about CTC, um, are there kind of any questions about uh, this, this part, about the RNN component? Okay. And so how do we train this thing? Um, and so, a really important thing to note is that in OCR training, we do not know, at least the way the training is done, typically, we don't know the alignment between the input and the output. And so in other words, let's say that you have just a simple, let's say you want to OCR this slide, okay? And like your labeled data would be, I just get an annotator to type in the bullet points um, of this slide, but that annotator would not annotate the bounding box for every character. So remember when we talked about object detection, we're annotating each box. Um, but that's not the way that you do OCR. Um, you just, um, the labeled data is, this is what this page says. And there's no bounding box information there. Um, and um, this is really important. Um, to kind of both knowing what the architecture should be, but also like understanding kind of like um, weird stuff that comes out because the output of the OCR engine will give you bounding boxes, um, but they're pretty off. And that can kind of, um, sometimes that can make sense when you think about this. Um, and so um, this is challenging. Um, so we know that this slide says in OCR training data, we do not know dot, 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 um, but, so that's the target sequence we're going for. We want the OCR to produce the sequence of characters on this page, but we don't know the ground truth for where the characters are. And so how do we go about aligning the ground truth sequence with this sequence, which is outputting a character token for every, um, essentially for every sequence um, in the features map. Um, and um, so I'm going to explain how we do that. Um, first, I want to say a couple of things. So first of all, the same problem arises in speech recognition. And actually, like the, the architecture for speech recognition is super similar to the architecture for OCR. Um, 
and which is kind of relevant to know because maybe advantages in speech recognition tell us something about how to make a better OCR. Um, so essentially in speech recognition, instead of these image files that are passed through the CNN, we have audio files um, and uh, we have transcripts of what's said, um, but we don't know for each syllable um, and what is said in that text output, what time it appears at in the audio file. So it's essentially exactly the same problem. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is, you know, I've talked a few times throughout the course about how, you know, how like OCR is traditionally trained as you have a human annotator that types in what is in that document and that's your labeled data. But we talked about how really like you could use data augmentation potentially. If you had a way to mimic what your documents look like, say using a GAN, you could use data augmentation to create your labeled data. And once we're in that world, like we no longer have this problem um, because um, now we know exactly the bounding box of each character because we're the one who generated the document. Um, and so I just kind of note that. I think that like um, in that case, you, you, you would have a different loss and you'd have to kind of think about that. Um, but that's kind of an interesting point. Um, but in today's world, like if you're using kind of um, like the OCR products that are out there, they're using the CTC loss. Okay, so, so let's suppose that, you know, our input, essentially going back here, these feature sequence, we have a feature sequence of length of six. So we have an image, let's say it's the image of the word cat, and we have um, the six spatial locations on the image that were that are slid across the image. And at each of those, we detect a token. Um, and so let's say we detect a C, a C, A, 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 T. Um, and the desired target output is the word cat. Um, and so the naive approach would be just to collapse this, right? Collapse the CC to a C, the AAA to an A, and then the T is already a T. Obviously that's not gonna work um, because lots of words have duplicate letters. That's like an inherent, I guess, just look at the slide, an inherent part of the um, English language. We wouldn't be able to recognize a sign or collapse or letters. Um, so obviously that's not going to work. Um, and so the way that CTC addresses this is to add a blank token, which is called epsilon. So sometimes it's called a space token, but don't mistake it with an actual space, um, which is itself like a token. But this is talking about kind of this epsilon is the, the space between letters. Um, and so this is an example from trying to um, OCR the word hello. Um, and by the way, one thing I'd like to note here is that the CTC paper, which the citation is here, is a distill paper, um, which means it has amazing visualization. And so I'd really recommend going and checking this out and you'll see their cool visualization and it will be kind of um, better than what I can do um, on the slides, um, just uh, copying and pasting their visualizations. Um, but essentially here you have hello, um, and here there's something like a 10, um, uh, like features vectors there. And so you're getting it to recognize H, H, E, Epsilon, Epsilon, L, 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 Epsilon, L, L, O. And so first what you do is to merge the repeated characters. Um, and then you remove the Epsilon tokens because remember those are just the spaces between like letters in the same word. Um, and the remaining characters are the output. Um, and so you'll note here that the mapping from the input uh, to CTC, which is this kind of like um, longer sequence that's at the level of each time step of the RNN versus the uh, output target that you're trying to match, um, that mapping is many to one. Okay, so here's an illustration again from the distilled paper. Um, and so you start with an input sequence. They're showing this as a spectrogram of audio, but in our case, this would be um, the um, uh, features, the final features layer from your CNN. So you chop off the classifier head of your CNN and just take it as a features extractor. You take that final features layer and you input that into an RNN where you're kind of chopping that up into um, windows. Um, and then you move across that um, and um, this is a vocabulary where um, we have um, uh, four letters, H, E, L, and O. And then we also have that um, 
epsilon token. And in this visualization, um, it's giving you um, the probability of each of those outputs. And so you can see at the first step, it thinks the H is most likely as shown by it having the darkest shade, then it thinks E, then it thinks um, that epsilon and so on and so forth. And so what you can do is with the per time step output distribution, you can compute the probability kind of of all the different possible sequences um, and you see like a few examples there um, and um, that can give you the distribution over output. So remember the darker is higher probability. And so in this example, kind of the hello is most likely, but it could be a low or hello. Um, and um, so here's just another kind of example showing the same thing. So here you're doing handwriting recognition. You have an A and a B and there's five columns and that um, kind of features vector, you divide it up into five time steps. Um, and it says the first three are A, then there's that um, kind of space between letters token and then a B. Um, and it's showing those as sort of the most likely path through. Um, and so you have different alignments that are valid. So for the word cat, you see on the left, like those are three different examples that will give you the word cat. Um, and then on the right, you see things that aren't. So it gives you CCAT or um, it um, has the wrong length or it gives you CT. Um, and so essentially you're computing kind of all these kind of possible alignments and marginalizing over the ones that Kind of give you the same thing and then you're going to compare that um you know take the most uh, the probability of the uh, most likely one and compare that to your loss and as i said this is very analogous for um ocr and text-to-speech um and you know we don't really have time to go into how you compute this um but just a couple of things. Uh, so just more broadly speaking, you would use CTC loss in combination with an RNN that estimates per time step probabilities that you need to kind of match to the output sequence. So that's the, the you know, general summing it up. Um, so you might you know, be concerned rightly that this loss could be very, very expensive to com compute um, because there can be a very large number of alignments. Um, you know, so just even going back to this toy example, um, you can see that there's going to be kind of um, many potential combinations. Um, and again, the paper on distill, it's great. It has an explanation with many, many uh, visualizations about how they essentially use a dynamic programming algorithm uh, to compute the loss much more quickly by merging alignments that have reached the same output um, at the same step. And so, if you're kind of interested in how this is done in practice, that paper is a really great reference. Okay, so are there any questions um, about the loss? Okay, so now we need to put this all together. Um, so now that you've seen kind of what an RNN and what is what CTC is like. Um, hopefully this diagram that I showed at the beginning is going to make more sense. You start with an input image, you pass it through your convnet to get your convolutional features maps. You divide that up into this feature sequence where you're just essentially, um, you know, um, uh, you know, um, dividing up that features map into a sequence and those become the inputs into a deep bidirectional LSTM, um, which is going to um, make per frame predictions um, of the distributions over what character appears. And then you're going to use the CTC, which they've called here a transcription layer, to match that um, with a predicted sequence. So this is the general architecture. Here's showing it with a bit of a different graph, which is one that we made um, for a custom numbers OCR pipeline. So these are numbers in Japanese, which are like the same as numbers in Chinese. And essentially the issue was that they're like perfectly uh, legible to the human eye, uh, but they use a flat font that 
um, that the OCR product was not trained on and it just couldn't even recognize that there was text there um, at all, which is kind of nuts, but that's, um, it just wasn't exposed to that in training. So it just couldn't even recognize it as a character. Um, and so what we did is essentially kind of very similar to, to what we've seen so far. We have an input example that you can see there on the left, we pass it through a CNN and that gives us an image feature. And then to start our RNN, it's like a character level RNN that is essentially like, just like the character level RNN for the hello example that I showed you earlier in the lecture. And so instead of, you know, in that example, we initialized our history with just a vector of zeros, um, which is what you were doing if you, you were just running the RNN, but now we've stacked these. Um, and so we're gonna initialize our history um, with that um, image features vector and we start the RNN with a start token um, and we combine that start token with the features vector, the history um, to predict the first character, which is like a one. And now we take that back um, and um, we, we know that that's the output because it needs to be aligned. And then we go to the next step and the next step to predict the um, numbers that appear in the sequence. And we're gonna use, it's not showing on this diagram, but we're gonna use CTC. Um, to align things and it works, it works quite well. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about how we did this in practice and how we got sort of the training data on this. But an important thing to note is that this is trained end to end, right? So when we train this, we haven't fixed any of the weights. And so it can um, learn the weights kind of along, you know, all um, layers of the network. Um, which I think is like a really powerful paradigm. I mean, so again, if you use OCR off the shelf, um, you're just gonna use, like you're just doing inference on whatever they trained it on. Um, and so you're not really getting that. But if you're training your own OCR, it can, if you have the kind of labeled data that you can need, it can solve a lot of problems in like a very elegant way. And so something like kind of common that you'll see, um, when social scientists are trying to OCR stuff is they might spend a lot of effort trying to use kind of rule-based methods to de-skew their documents. Because if documents are skewed and you just feed them into something off the shelf that's not meant to address that, it's gonna like screw everything up, right? Because you're essentially sliding this window over a row and it's skewed. Um, but if you're training your own OCR end to end, um, the ComNet, you know, should be able to learn to de-skew that image, but do it in a learnable way that's not gonna be very brittle kind of with the rules that you put in. And so in principle, um, you know, in principle, like kind of end-to-end -end OCR training um, should kind of provide a one-stop solution to the, the distortions that can, you know, at least to some of the distortions that can come into play with your image um, and so kind of the traditional solution of I'm gonna do rule-based non-deep learning stuff and then feed that in. I mean, it's kind of a little bit reminiscent of the first region CNN where it just used this traditional computer vision method to get the um, region proposals and then feed those in. And you have to do that kind of over and over. Um, in principle, deep learning should be better at this. But again, you're gonna to have to have the data to train your OCR network. And maybe for a lot of applications, what's off the shelf works well enough and it's not worth it. Um, but you know, it's, it's, it's good to be kind of aware of that benefit that this training end to end should be a pretty powerful way um, to kind of take care of distortions that might enter your documents. Um, I also wanted to briefly show a slide. And so this is Easy OCR, which is an open source OCR package that just kind of came out within the past year that's gotten a lot of attention because basically the open source solutions are Tesseract and now Easy OCR. You probably don't want to use Easy OCR on your documents. It was designed for OCR in the wild. Remember that I talked about before. So for this OCR of, um, of natural images. Um, but it's again, kind of like instructive to see its architecture because it's doing kind of exactly what we talked about. So you have an image, it's doing some kind of pre-processing, then it's putting it through craft, which is like an object detection model that's meant for detecting text 
um, in natural images. So think of this kind of like, guess, like a very lightweight version of mask or CNN, where you just want to say text, no text. It's going to do some more processing, like something that always happens with OCR is you need to binarize the image. And so there's various kind of processing that happens. Um, then it's doing the ResNet uh, plus LSTM plus CTC. Um, and um, it's going to produce the output with kind of some other stuff along the way. So again, this is like a paradigm that's, that's very similar um, to what we just talked about. Um, and we'll discuss OCR in practice next class.